everyone. It is with immense pleasure that I welcome our amazing panelists and our audience on Zoom and Facebook Live to this inaugural webinar organized by the Voices Youth Team, an intergenerational panel discussion on multidisciplinary perspectives on the world free of nuclear weapons. My name is Kehka Shabasu. I am the lead of the Voices Youth Team and the founder president of Green Hope Foundation. Voices is a cooperation circle of the United Religions Initiative. Its purpose is to assist in the effort to abolish nuclear weapons through peace building and conflict transformation and who for the past 10 years have met each month to uh, work towards nuclear abolition. So I feel that it is quite opportune and relevant that we should gather during these turbulent times to seek pathways and solutions to give the greatest gift to humankind. And that is a world that is free from the menace of nuclear weapons. And how ironic is it that when nations are literally on their knees from the impact of COVID-19, trying to find resources to buy the desperately needed vaccines, that they still don't think of stopping the continued wasteful expenditure on nuclear arsenals and weapons of mass destruction. And while I hold leaders accountable, I also question us citizens for accepting this. Is it complacency? Is it ignorance? Is it a lack of empathy or combinations of all of that. And unless we're able to change this apathy and rouse people, we will not see change. Our world is at a crossroads. And while the pandemic has caused immense pain and hardships, it has also brought about a realization that it is time to do things differently. There is talk of building a new normal, and we must seize the moment to transform today's challenging scenario into an opportunity for rebuilding better. This is the objective of our gathering today, an intergenerational congregation of voices, each of us united in our common passion of turning the dream of a nuclear weapons free world into a reality. Now more than ever before, we need to collaborate, allow cross-pollination of ideas and network through multilateral platforms to finding ways of mitigation to this issue that has defied our efforts for the last eight decades. So I am extremely pleased to welcome our experts today, the Right Reverend William Swing, President and Founding Trustee, United Religions Initiative, Leona Morgan, Coordinator, Nuclear Issues Study Group, Ambassador Thomas Graham, former Special Representative for President Clinton for Disarmament, Arms Control, and Non-Proliferation, Pragna Vasubal, Head of Events, Green Hope Foundation Global, Marilyn Turkovich, Executive Director, Charter for Compassion, Peng Hui, Youth Member, Sakagakai Malaysia, and Monica Willard, United Religions Initiative, UN representative. Before we begin, I would like to inform our audience that if you do have questions, please do leave them in the Q&A box or raise your hand on Zoom or put your questions in the comments section on Facebook Live and we and our panelists would be happy to answer your questions. So with that, we shall begin our panel discussion and the first question that I would like to ask is, and this is directed to Ambassador Graham, how do we tackle mindsets such as blind patriotism as seen in the nuclear states that hinder the progress of the nuclear disarmament movement? Uh, you're referring to blind patriotism uh, among the nuclear weapon states. Uh, in the question, and I don't think that's what it is at all. Uh, um, I don't think really, well, in patriotism in, in a sense, I suppose, but uh, there's three reasons why uh, the, 
I can think of that why uh, countries have uh, uh, attempted or actually acquired nuclear weapons. They were the superpowers at the beginning. Uh, the United States acquired nuclear weapons because we were afraid that Hitler was going to get them first and, and dominate the world uh, during World War II. The Soviet Union acquired nuclear weapons because we had. And uh, there was never a serious attempt. Well, there's only one serious attempt at the very beginning, the Baruch plan, but that fell by the wayside quickly and little was done for uh, non-proliferation. And it spread to uh, the Britain and France and their purpose was simply to uh, achieve great power status. It wasn't patriotism, it was prestige. And then um, uh, the other three, China, um, arguably, uh, other four actually, China, claim they were doing it for uh, defensive purposes, but I think it was a prestige for them as well, regardless of what they said, because of the, the Soviet Union and, and, and the uh, Western states. The other, uh, other four, uh, uh, India acquired nuclear weapons for prestige. They claim it was fear of China, but it was actually Prestige, they thought about it, argued about it since 1948 before they finally did their first tests. And, and then Israel was, that was uh, survival. Uh, Pakistan, that was survival. And uh, North Korea, that was survival. So those are the, re those are the reasons that could, uh, in my view, in any case, why uh, the nine states that have nuclear weapons have acquired them. And in order to achieve worldwide disarmament, uh, some of those questions are gonna have to be asked. How does Pakistan, how does Israel, how does North Korea assure its uh, uh, security without nuclear weapons? You have to answer that question. And, and other questions as well, that countries like Iran that doesn't have nuclear weapons at this point might ask. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And yes, it has been about prestige and for some people, so some countries survival as well. And of course we have to ask that important question and governments have to do that, that how do they assure uh, security to their citizens but without nuclear weapons that threaten all of humanity. So that brings me to the next question, which is, in your opinion, where were we, where have we come, and what lies ahead in the next 10 years in our quest for nuclear disarmament? So, Marilyn, we shall begin by hearing your views. You have All them. right. Well, uh, where uh, are we? Oh, sorry. And it's fine. You can go ahead and then... Okay. Where, where, where we were was a really terrible place. Where we were was in a world of huge arsenals. Uh, we built 70, 72,000 nuclear weapons. The Soviets built 55,000 nuclear weapons. We were worst casing each other because the verification wasn't that good. We weren't sure what they had and vice versa. Uh, everything was on the launch on warning policy, under launch on warning policies, which meant that uh, there were six or at least six uh, incidents which came down to the last two or three minutes before one country, one side or the other, and they were on both sides, launched their nuclear weapons first. I mean, it's amazing we got through those 45 years without uh, blowing ourselves up, but we did. And now the level is down to about 13,000. There's no more launch on warning. Uh, uh, all states understand that using nuclear weapons is a terrible idea, and uh, it's the situation is much better than it was. That's not to say it's good, but it's much better than it was. But <clears throat> the non-proliferation treaty came along to 
1968 entered into force in 1970, which uh, prevented, prevented and worked very well, prevented the spread worldwide of nuclear weapons. Uh, John F. Kennedy very much feared that would happen. He called it the, the greatest danger and hazard uh, that faces the world. That is the spread of nuclear weapons all over the world. That didn't happen. Uh, it stopped at a far lower number than JFK predicted. He predicted 25 at least, and, and we're at nine. Um, so that's, that's somewhat of a success. But um, in, in recent years, and, and also the, the, the strategic arms limitation process brought the numbers down, uh, considerably contributed to bringing the numbers down. But now we're at an impasse in the NPT. We can't bring the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty into force, which is the, is the political price that, or the, the principal part of the political price that the nuclear weapon states were supposed to deliver in exchange for the rest of the world giving up nuclear weapons. And that's never been achieved. And now there's a problem in the Middle East, a serious conflict between the Arabs and the Israelis over the Israeli nuclear weapon program. And that's at a stalemate also. Both of those threaten the uh, viability of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and then <clears throat> looking ahead 10 years, um, one has to be deeply worried about the ability to uh, uh, control the spread of nuclear weapons. And, and <clears throat> along with that, the number, because climate change is coming down the road. It's already on us. Uh, we're having a huge wildfires and, and big storms, which are symptoms of climate change. And Gradually, countries are going to start to lose their arable land. It will become desert and lose their fresh water sources. Uh, already 2 billion people in the world are short of water. And that's something that human beings have been fighting over for the last 3,000 years, food and water. And it'll be no, no different now, uh, except that smaller countries that don't have nuclear weapons that have neighbors that, uh, that have armies and are larger are going to be tempted to acquire nuclear weapons to defend what they have vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, the depredations of climate change. So this is a time of immense urgency to strengthen what we have as much as possible to strengthen the NPT and try to move toward uh, the, the abolition, but it better happen fast because, uh, uh, I mean, we you know in a few years, because uh, climate change will pre largely prevent it from happening unless we stop climate change, which I hope that we do. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ambassador uh, Graham. And it is a time uh, to take urgent action now. So I should now give the floor to Marilyn to share her views with us. Marilyn, you're on mute. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, building on what Tom said, um, wouldn't it be incredible if everyone understood uh, the severity of what Tom has raised? And we don't. Um, I think the majority of the world's population has just shoved the whole nuclear issue in the back of the closet. And, you know, that's just part of humanity, isn't it? We always find ourselves dealing with the crisis in front of us. And we often lack the whole, the holistic picture that we need to have. And I, I'm reminded of, um, the wonderful book uh, that David Corton wrote, uh, Change the Story and Change the Future. So as we sit here and we talk about, you know, what has gone on in the past, and it's so important, we can't move forward, 
really constructively and knowledgeably unless we do understand that past that, that is so much a part of everything that Thomas has been talking about. Um, we have to not glide along that same path. We have to change the story. And, and maybe sometimes um, I remember, and many of you probably uh, remember this as well, you know, outline your story before you write it. Well, I could never do that. I always had to write my story and then I did the outline. And I think that, um, you know, that's where we are. We, we have to write the story and the story is a world free of nuclear weapons. It's a world um, that's open to beginning to understand the interdependency on which we have come to live and rely on uh, for good or bad. And that is part of our future. And you know what, what is really most necessary is the communication, the thoughts, the ideas, the history, the reality, but then the creativity, the innovation of just saying no. You know, we have to think about where do all of these issues that we have in front of us, the issue of not understanding one another, the issue of the climate, um, the issue of creating and storing these horrible weapons uh, and, and putting them there at, at the peril of the whole world. So, you know, we've come obviously a long way and you know we have a long way to go and and the beauty of this is that we can do this together uh, across intergenerational lines uh, i was real fortunate to see margaret mead before she died many years ago um, and she she was really passionate about the fact that she said give me the wisdom of people of my age, give me the youth to work with so that they can create, innovate and bring about change. And let's take, let's take this forward. And all of those people who are doubters about any number of things, who are stayed in their opinions, stayed in their own history, afraid to move, then let them just let them be. Let us take control. Let the youth and the older people do this. And I, I think that that's, you know, when, when you ask, um, you know, what lies ahead in 10 years, I think it's right here. The people that are here, and there are thousands, if not hundreds of thousands more people who are willing to work in communion with one another to really change the story of the future. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And uh, Peng, let us hear from you. Uh, thank you, Kekushin. Um, I I'd completely agree with um, where former Ambassador Graham mentioned earlier when he said we are currently at somewhat of an impasse, relying only on world leaders to decide whether we should abolish nuclear weapons altogether or not. And um, what Marilyn mentioned earlier was very profounding too, like changing our story, changing how we view, changing how people perceive um, nuclear weapons do do make a huge um, do make a, a huge change altogether. And so the question itself asks like what, what, what is it in the next 10 years for the quest for nuclear disarmament? And I'd say that the next 10 years will be, infinitely a lot more tougher than the years that we've had since Cold War itself. But I truly believe that we can carry on the momentum that has built from the years since and forward. I believe that we do need a lot more grassroots movements to spread the awareness and even further including them into our education system altogether. One that inculcates the um, values of human dignity empathy, empowerment, and other common humanistic ideals to establish more conversation and creating more ripples to propagate this cause. So I'd like to share something um, just 
shy of two months ago, um, on the 30th of September, Malaysia became the 46th nation to um, sign the instrument of ratification for the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, TPNW. It was a moment of um, mixed emotions for myself and countless other Malaysians out there. Because for one, we felt that it was definitely overdue. But more importantly, we began asking ourselves, what now? What is our next step? As 2021 approach approaches and TPNW becomes a binding treaty, we are continuously tasked with disseminating awareness in our community whilst working with an array of networks from both governmental and civil society to create a world free from nuclear weapons. And I'll even stress further where it's not just nuclear weapons itself, but we need to eradicate that mindset that allowed nuclear weapons to exist in the first place, not just the weapon itself, but the ideas that permits their existence altogether. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. We do definitely need to change our story, as Marilyn said, and that does begin with our education systems, with our mindset uh, change, and of course, taking actions on the ground and not just waiting for governments to take actions. And thank you so much uh, for sharing that with us, because right now we are living in very trying times at a time when we've seen that uh, you know, the gross inequalities that have been highlighted by the pandemic. And these inequalities are world faces on a daily basis. So how has this changed your outlook towards the threats to our existence, such as nuclear weapons? So Pragna, let's hear from you. Thank you so much, Kekush. Done. And I am so happy to be part of this important discussion today. To answer your question, this year has been a very unsettling one, and that in some ways is an understatement. With the COVID-19 pandemic taking over our lives in a way that no one could have ever imagined. It is also quite ironic that this year marks the 50th anniversary of the NPT, and it is also 75 years since the fateful twin bombing that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The nuclear club is quite infamous and it grasped the COVID excuse to postpone the review of the NPT, which was supposed to be held in March 2020. This was a major setback. Well, ideally, the reverse should have taken place. The pandemic has given us a chance to reassess everything and we should have seized the moment to stop this wastage of resources into nuclear weapons at this point in time. When the virus hit, none of the countries were sufficiently equipped to handle the billions of dollars that were spent on the modernization of nuclear arms were spent on healthcare facilities, countries would have been better prepared to handle the pandemic. The irony of the whole situation is that the same countries that were worst hit by the virus continue to hold on to their arsenals and some like India ahead and increased their spending, test firing the hypersonic technology demonstrator vehicle while gloating about being only the fourth country in the world after the US, China and Russia to develop and test this technology while millions of its citizens moved it deeper into poverty. Even after witnessing the drastic consequences of the pandemic, countries have still not defunded or redirected their funds. The pandemic has, as you said, revealed the gross inadequacies of our governments and the fragility of our social infrastructure. The pandemic has brought even the mightiest of nuclear nations to its knees, putting the test of our perspective that the acquisition of nuclear weapons makes nations mightier. As representatives of civil society, we need to demand greater accountability from these nations. When one country falls back on its commitment or withdraws from a nuclear non-proliferation policy, it creates a domino effect. This urges other countries to do the same in the name of national security. 
We should start approaching the problems of nuclear arms proliferation proactively. We also need to force political leaders to make rational decisions to prioritize saving lives over the accumulation of mass destruction weapons. The virus has proven to know no boundaries. We need to learn from this. This is hardly a better, ex there is hardly a better example than COVID-19 for the need for international cooperation and multilateralism. Just like how the coronavirus was not being taken seriously in the beginning, the threat of a nuclear war is also being ignored. We should not have to wait for another nuclear explosion to realize its consequences and finally start acting proactively on this situation. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Pragna. And yes, it is. we should not treat the nuclear uh, weapons issue like we did COVID-19 uh, and be so grossly underprepared for tackling an issue such as this. So thank you for sharing that with us. And uh, we all know that you know, nuclear weapons are probably the greatest threat to all of creation. So the next question that I would like to pose is, what is the role of faith and faith-based organizations in nuclear disarmament? And how does the absence or inclusion of faith affect the nuclear disarmament movement? And for this, I would like to begin by asking uh, Bishop Swing. So Bishop Swing, you have the floor. Bishop Swing, you're on mute. Thank you so much. Um, in terms of um, faith, uh, from a Christian perspective, uh, when you open up the Bible, it starts at the very beginning of uh, the creation story. And for us, uh, it all comes down to the creation story. And in that story, there was one tree of the fruit of one tree. Don't eat, don't eat that. You can eat everything else, but don't do that. Because uh, if you do that, it's going to destroy the garden. It's going to destroy life as we know it. And uh, people have argued, what, what's that apple? Or what's that, what's that fruit? And uh, uh, for me, um, that fruit is nuclear weapons. Uh, it is antithetical to everything in the garden of creation. Uh, there's one thing that could bring it all down and uh, uh, to create the antithetical uh, um, fruit is blasphemy. Uh, there's only, uh, everything is procreation. Uh, nuclear weapons are anti-creation, uh, the ultimate blasphemy, the ultimate, uh, and all religions know this. So all religions uh, write statements <laughs> and nobody reads those statements. It's kind of like, okay, we, we did our job, we wrote a statement, but, um, how many times have you heard a sermon preached in a church or a synagogue or a mosque on nuclear weapons? Probably never in your life. Uh, how many youth groups have ever tackled the issue of nuclear weapons? Probably never in religious uh, settings. Um, I heard Jerry Brown, the former governor of uh, California say he went to Washington to talk to the legislators, the Congress about nuclear weapons. And he said, no one was interested. Well, maybe a few. Um, uh, if you go to the world of religions, uh, they got it intellectually, uh, but they don't have it viscerally. Uh, they don't have it in a way that can bring you out on the street or bring you up into the pulpit to uh, let a rip. Um, so um, where is the moral fire going to come from? Um, it, it's not going to come from religion <laughs> unless there's a revival, unless uh, things change radically. It's just going to have to be, 
there's a religion inside all of us. There's a spirituality. There's a soul, and there's a sense of the sacred in all of us. Unless unless we get down to the sacred aspect of who we are, and understand what we're uh, challenging to destroy all creation, if we don't get there, uh, it's it's going to be argument after argument. But there's got to be a fundamental passion that uh, sends you into the street, and uh, uh, that's kind of, it's, it, it's not, it's not going to come from the top of religion with a bunch of statements. It's going to come from the sense of sacred that it, it is in the soul of all the people. So our job is to uh, tell the story accurately and passionately to appeal to the soul of the people. So that's going to, that's where, that's where my hope is. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, that accuracy and passion are very, very important in this uh, dialogue. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, Peng, what is your opinion on this? Thank you, Kekashan. So, um, as you've, um, if you just introduced me earlier, I am a youth member of Soka Gakai Malaysia, SGM, a faith-based organization and a value-creating society based on a Buddhist philosophy, Mission Buddhism. It cherishes the values of peace, culture, and education, embodying the integrity of life as its core tenets. Through SGM, I had the opportunity to share a peace proposal in 2018 in a public forum here in Malaysia. It was titled, Toward an Era of Human Rights, Building a People's Movement by Daisaku Ikeda, the president of Soka Gakai International. He has submitted a peace proposal to the United Nations annually since 1983, um, touching on a varying aspects from basic human rights, establishing a culture of peace, climate change, women empowerment, and an equal opportunity to access education. But they are always intertwined with a strong desire to rid nuclear weapons from this world, a desire established from the vow he made to his mentor Jose Toda, who condemned the existence of such weapons. And through this event, I had the opportunity to connect with a wider network from academics to government and non-governmental representatives to your regular mom and pops community, sharing some insights on the gross disregard of human rights that nuclear weapons pose. And we, we create awareness and avenues for conversations for nuclear disarmament. In short, I truly believe that a faith-based a faith -based organization can serve as a platform where we can have both intra and interfaith dialogues with a broader base of community, consolidating one common belief where nuclear weapons and humanity cannot coexist. The presence of Faith-based organizations can further serve as an avenue for youths to reach out, satiating a curious mind while remaining grounded with humanistic values. That's where I truly believe uh, a role of a faith-based organization can serve to further propagate um, the cause of nuclear disarmament. Thank you. Thank you, Peng, for sharing that with us. Monica, let's hear from you. Monica, you're on mute. Thank you for that reminder. Uh, I am honored to be on this call with you. And I think when I look at the role of faith leaders and faith organizations in this particular issue, um, I go back to the prayer we started with just as panelists, the nuclear prayer. And the beautiful prayer that um, Bishop Swing wrote, where it's talking about lifting the fog of atomic darkness that hovers so pervasively over our earth. And then he says, your earth, in mentioning a greater power. And I think about this in terms of individual actions, but also collectively. The Pope has come out very strongly um, against nuclear weapons, the threat of nuclear weapons, and supporting the uh, nuclear uh, test ban treaty. It has been um, 
not just the documents that Bill mentioned, but it is that lack of translation into the pews. And it is our jobs to really do that. And the voices of youth and the voices combined through intergenerational work is really important. And there are two things that I'd like to share that made a difference for me. And I hadn't even thought about this for a long time, but when we were covering under our desks, preparing um, during the uh, nuclear crisis in Cuba, there was also a call to go to the Coliseum in Los Angeles. That Coliseum hosted the opening of the Olympics. It, it's a huge stadium that's still used for football. And people gathered to pray the rosary. And when I asked my aunt why I was there, she said, I think it was the nuclear weapons um, issue that brought you there. And I said, well, that would have been young enough that I wouldn't have remembered why I was there, but I remembered collective prayer. I also remembered being deeply inspired by a task that happened in the 80s. And that is the Ribbon International. And that was to put on cloth what you could not bear to think of as lost forever in the event of a nuclear war. And this was a project that you did locally. You did it with your families, with your churches and libraries. We did it for a lot of places because I was very involved with the uh, American Association of University Women that went into the ribbon around the Pentagon. But it went into churches and it was Church Women United. And this was before the internet and cloth panels were made holding the hopes, dreams and prayers of people to end nuclear weapons. And quite honestly, when they cut in half, thank you so much to the work that went into the nuclear negotiations in the 80s and those which voices highlighted in our recent um, movie, the one in Reykjavik, and looking at eliminating an entire classification of nuclear weapons. But when the weapons started coming down, we focused more on the earth and the environment. And the weapons issue of nuclear weapons went from a million people on the streets of New York and in every church around, but the environment seemed to take over. So to me, our real mission right now is to protect the earth with the basic premise of nuclear weapons are genocidal and suicidal, and we cannot protect the earth and have nuclear weapons. That combination is vital in our hearts and in our prayers. Absolutely. Thank you so much uh, for sharing your views with us on that. And, you know, our panelists mentioned earlier that uh, nuclear uh, disarmament and nuclear, uh, the threat of a nuclear war is off. People don't realize it's right in front of us. They can't see it. And that is why uh, talks about these issues are kind of just brushed under the rug. So it's what the next question I'd like to ask is what inspired you to choose nuclear disarmament is your line of work, given that it's not a very commonly discussed topic. And for this as well, I'd like to ask Bishop Swing to uh, share his views with us. Yes, um, I'm glad this is intergenerational because uh, I am intergenerational. Uh, I, I carry uh, a little boy in me uh, who was born before there and lived uh, when there were no nuclear weapons in the world. Uh, I carry in me a, uh, a boy who saw the end of World War II and uh, we dropped the atomic bomb, America did, and we thought, wow, that's great, the ends of the war, stops all this fighting, brings everybody home. Uh, atomic bomb, that's great. Uh, then getting into uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis when, it, wait a minute, uh, the world is not 1945. It's not w one or two bombs. It's a whole lot of bombs and we're getting into a whole lot of countries uh, later on. And uh, we're sitting here with uh, uh, tens of thousands of weapons that could wipe out the world. Wait a minute. Uh, this is a new day. And then I became a parish priest and, uh, and you're worried about the parish and you're doing a couple of little things about racism here and uh, women's ordination there, et cetera. And then you become a bishop and then uh, you get a little older and then uh, 
you step back and you say, wait a minute, what's, what's the big picture here? Not just one issue or one issue, what's a big issue? Uh, and then it dawned on me that the big issue is, uh, is nuclear weapons. Uh, so um, I, can't, I can't remember what your question is, <laughs> but I'll get around to it if you give me one more chance. Sure, what inspired you to choose nuclear disarmament as your line of work? Yeah, um, I would say the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, when it went from uh, uh, going away from a childishness of thinking nuclear weapons are all right, nuclear weapons are uh, protecting me, uh, nuclear weapons are good for the world, keeping it in equilibrium. But then all of a sudden it dawns on me that it's all predicated on perfection. That nobody will ever, nobody with, with nuclear weapons will ever make a mistake. That no uh, system will ever go wrong, no, uh, uh, no algorithms and no data flow and nothing. It's we're we're all perfect people with perfect countries with perfect mechanisms, with uh, these ultimate weapons and our confidence is in our perfection. And if you <laughs> and we are so not perfect. And to put these weapons in our hands, it dawned on me that you put these kind of weapons in the hands of imperfect people. Uh, you know what's going. You know what's going to happen. Uh, it's it's foolish to think that uh, we can forever build bigger and bigger bombs, and we can have more and more countries with the bombs, and all this is going to be perfect forever. It's going to come crashing down, and when it comes crashing down, it's not going to be a little incident. Uh, it's going to be an incident and retaliation and retaliation on top of retaliation, and then, and then the whole creation is uh, demolished. And uh, so once that dawned on me, uh, it's it's sort of like a chain reaction, you know. Once once you figure out the real weapons, and then once you understand that human beings aren't perfect, and systems aren't perfect, uh, we're heading for the OK Corral. For the whole universe, or for our world, uh, so that was the, that was the thing that got me. Thank you for sharing that uh, with us. And yes, humans are imperfect, so are our systems. And yes, one mistake can literally destroy the whole world. Uh, thank you for sharing that with us, Monica. Let's hear from you. What inspired you? As I said, I think it started with prayer, but it also started with education. I read the book Hiroshima. And even though I was born after World War II and hearing the stories of how the bomb ended the war, the horrors that were inflicted on people. And that book just changed my life forever. And then I saw Vietnam and I saw that we didn't use nuclear weapons. So I realized, hmm, maybe there's a reason we're not using nuclear weapons. And it was more education that brought me around to the fact that these cannot be used, that it is just immoral. And I couldn't give you all of the statistics on the power of bombs, but to me, it is not only heartbreaking, it is an absolute moral affront to put our science, our education systems, built on destroying the planet. It just doesn't make sense. And um, I think about the quote from Eisenhower about how every, and he didn't even talk about nuclear weapons. It was that every bullet deprives food and hunger and education from others because the money and the expertise and the sense of the patriotism or prestige, as Tom put it. Why are we putting it into destruction? We can call back for better and we are it's demanded of us. And I so appreciate the intergenerational approach as we look at what we know, as Bill said, 
We know the end story. Marilyn, thank you. We start at the last page and work backwards. We can't afford to get to the last page of that nuclear accident, nuclear use of force, prestige. This is not prestige. This is absolute insanity and we must make a better choice now. Absolutely, it is insanity and the, and the onus is really on us right now to be able to take that extra step towards uh, achieving uh, a world free of nuclear weapons. Thank you for sharing that with us. Leona, let's hear from you. What inspired you to join this nuclear disarmament movement and choose it as your line of work? Um, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me today. Um, and I actually don't work on nuclear disarmament directly. Um, I, I live in the Southwest in the United States and um, my people are Diné. We um, have uh, our, I guess our reservation um, up there, you might call it a reserve. And it's, it's within our traditional homelands of our four sacred mountains. And this is an area that has been mined heavily for uranium. And so the work that I do is largely focused around protection of our homelands and, and dealing with some of the ongoing and current issues from that mining. And so because uranium is used for fuel for both electricity and weapons, I think in order to, to stop um, nuclear proliferation and, and development of energy, we, we really need to also consider the impacts that the human rights and, and, and the current you know, contamination and health impacts of those living around the mines. Um, in the United States, there's over 15,000 abandoned uranium mines, most of which have been unaddressed. And um, the, there's about 520 on our lands that are being um, cleaned up, but it's, very, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a very um, quick process. And the cleanup is not always to the community's um, standards. And so, this is, this is why I'm here today um, joining all of you is, is to talk about the uranium mining impacts, not just to my people, but it affects indigenous people worldwide. Most of the time uranium um, extraction and, and production is on indigenous people's lands. And so I've heard the same stories um, from, from many different people about you know, the worker conditions at the time, you know, lack of information about um, the, the impacts from radiation exposure or, or you know, um, and, and, and really simple things like, um, you know, today with COVID-19, everybody, um, especially frontline workers know, you know, when they get home to go straight to the shower, you know, take off their, their outer garments and, and to, to protect their families. Um, our, our, our relatives who did mining and, and that kind of thing, they weren't taught this. And so, you know, some, some workers came home and, and, and contaminated their, their, their home environment and leading to really devastating health problems to, to their, their families. And I've even heard stories about people bringing home materials from the mines and entire families um, developing cancers and, and these kinds of things. So today there is still mining. Um, one of the country, the leading, one of the leading countries uh, that has the biggest mining companies is, is, is Canada. Um, and there are a lot of Canadian mines impacting, you know, us in the U.S. Um, in different in different places in the world. And so this is something I think that if we can stop the source of the the fuel for nuclear weapons, this will contribute to nuclear as well. And so we we don't need new nuclear um, energy as well because if if I, I don't believe in nuclear energy as a, a transition energy. Um, this is uh, something that needs to be dispelled immediately, especially with the younger generation that's saying, you know, nuclear can be used for a transition energy because it's so-called low carbon. The reason it's considered this is because they don't count all of the processes before the power plant and they don't count the carbon footprint of managing the waste after the power plant has been dismantled. Um, so we, we do need to consider, you know, um, educating people about the connection between nuclear energy and nuclear weapons, because the byproduct of nuclear energy, plutonium, is used in weapons. 
And so I think more and more we need to somehow bridge the gap um, between the anti um, nuclear energy movement and the peace movement, especially um, as we're moving toward, you know, the um, enforcement of the, the UN treaty um, coming uh, next year. So I, I have a lot more to, to share and talk about, especially with the nuclear waste issues. But I think if we stop uranium mining that and clean up all of the abandoned uranium mines around the world, that is the first step um, to, to, you know, changing how we understand um, the, the, the entire nuclear fuel chain. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Leona, for sharing that with us. And uh, you bring up such an important point. There are a plethora of issues that surround nuclear weapons, and we have to deal with uh, stopping this nuclear colonialism first, and thereby stopping uh, uranium mining, uh, as well as uh, moving towards nuclear energy if we are actually uh, to uh, achieve nuclear disarmament. And I'd just like to add that you mentioned Canada and the mining. And what most people don't uh, know is that uh, the uranium that went into Fat Man and Little Boy that caused Hiroshima and Nagasaki came from the Dene uh, community mines where, uh, as you mentioned, the Dene uh, community workers were not informed that uh, what they were mining was radioactive. And that is why thousands of people over there died from cancer caused by the uranium mining. So Hiroshima and Nagasaki did not just kill thousands of people in Japan, it also, the process of making those weapons also killed thousands of people elsewhere. So thank you so much for uh, bringing up this very, very crucial point. And now the okay. final, uh, sorry, you were saying something? I, I, I'm sorry, if I could just chime in um, yes. very quickly. Um, so the, the, the uranium that actually was used um, tr the Trinity test, the very first nuclear um, blast, and then Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And this is something I'm learning too. I always thought it came from our sacred mountain in New Mexico, but it actually came from the democratic, um, the current Democratic Republic of the Congo. And so back then, it definitely was an issue of nuclear colonialism. And, and so this is something I've been in contact with some um, people in Africa who are dealing with this because the Shinkolobwe mine it produced uranium that was um, very powerful, 65% uranium. Whereas today we're mining uranium that is less than 1% uranium. Um, the, the, the ore of uranium is less than 1%. And so that 65% uranium that came from Africa, it, it really devastated those communities and wasn't cleaned up. And there's a push to restart that mine. So I think this is a great time if folks want to support those communities, but I just had to let you know that it, it came from Africa and traveled all the way to the US and all over the country, leaving a trail of radiation wherever it went. And so this is something, if folks want to, I'm gonna put a link in the chat. Um, we can support the communities and some people working on that issue. Um, they're asking for donations. So I just wanted to, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, thanks for giving me a, a couple minutes to explain that connection to, to D DRC. Sure, absolutely. And this, like I said, this is such, an important topic uh, of discussion that needs to be brought to the forefront. So thank you for sharing that with us. And now I will move on to our final question uh, before opening the floor for questions from the audience. And I feel that this is a very pertinent question given the topic of our webinar today. How can different generations work together across disciplines to achieve nuclear disarmament? So Pragna, let's start with you. Yes, thank you so much, Kakashan. The nuclear disarmament issue directly impedes the progress of the sustainable development goals. And it needs all sections of civil society to come together to make disarmament as a top action priority. Uh, as the previous panelists said, strategic panelists, uh, strategic partnerships between governments, international organizations, and the civil society, actually the youth, is imperative in achieving a nuclear arms free world. In today's complicated international environment with priorities ranging from climate change to sustainable development and pandemics, somehow the threat of nuclear weapons has taken a back seat. To me, this, this does not to be a coincidence. 
It is through these subversive and diversionary tactics that the nuclear club of nations have succeeded in avoiding disarmament. The way to move forward is to remove this cloak of secrecy and make the issue of nuclear arms take center stage. Many people either feel that nuclear arms are not the immediate priority or feel helpless in the whole situation. This is where I feel young people can take the lead. The younger generations have the power of social media. I believe that we can use this tool to create a multiplier effect and influence public opinion. Creating awareness holds the key and actions must be taken from a grassroots level. And this is our mission at Green Hope Foundation. Um, our teams work on peace building by creating awareness through disarmament education. We mobilize young people through our workshops, our webinars, our debates involving subject matter experts. And in the process, we dispel the myth that nuclear disarmament is too complex and technical for young people to comprehend. Incidentally, our youngest voice is only six years old. We harness the energy uh, of social media to spread our messages and make an impact. Not only do we work at a grassroots level, we also amplify our demand through active interventions at high level political forums, since it is about time that youth do have a seat at the table. But I believe that we have a long way to go Despite the advantages of growing up in a time of global connectedness, there still remains a large gap in the participation of the youth in these discussions. Nuclear disarmament and peace education should be made mandatory in schools to make the youth realize their huge role and responsibility in this movement. Young people under the age of 30 make up half of the world's population. So it is just ridiculous not to include us. We need to demolish the patriarchy and bureaucracy that prevent our engagement in this process. Laws, agendas, policies need to change. But to make that happen, we need more young people and, uh, and women in parliament and in corporate boards. At the same time, younger generations need to understand and acknowledge that we have a huge responsibility. We, and we have proved time and again that if we are educated, encouraged, and empowered, we are capable of making a difference. Thank you so much, uh, Pratna, for sharing that uh, with us. And definitely, we need that uh, cross-generational dialogue and multidisciplinary dialogue so that all of us can work together uh, to achieve uh, our dream of a nuclear weapons free world. So thank you once again. Leona, please share your perspectives on this question with us. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I think uh, right now, and and just just to preface my statement again, I, I work more currently on the nuclear waste issues that are created from nuclear energy development, um, because right now we're in New Mexico, we're facing uh, a, a proposal to build the world's largest nuclear waste dump. And this would be a, a nuclear waste dump for more, more than double the amount of waste that even exists in the United States. And um, the people that I work with, um, they, they all consider me youth. They think I'm a, you know, a young person that can help uh, to, to carry this fight on for the next generations. But I'm, I'm on my next birthday, I'm going to be 40 years old. And so to hear that you all have a representative of a public a speaker who's six years old is, is just incredible. And I, I would love to work with people at those eight, those very young ages to, to, to open their minds to this work because in the United States, and I see this internationally as well, that the, the people doing this type of work are predominantly um, older white men. And so the expertise of, of the, all of this nuclear stuff, the laws, the politics, the, the, tech, the technology, the science, um, it's largely um, 
held within the the minds of an aging generation and i don't see any transmission active transmission happening to the younger generation and it's imperative that we create mentorship problem um, i'm sorry i'm my 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 clock is going off i apologize for the noise but um it's imperative that we create mentorship programs as well as um, a dialogue like this this event today I, I applaud you all for putting this intergenerational panel together um, but I think besides public events we do need for me personally when I learned about uranium mining um, because my family was being you know my family was getting sick and and there was proposals for new mining I, I got involved in 2007 after I graduated from college they didn't teach about uranium mining in in schools and I lived, I went to high school less than 20 miles from the world's largest uranium spill that occurred in Church Rock, New Mexico. And I, you know, being so close to this spill and not knowing about it is, 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 is wrong. We, we need to educate our young people. And if this is through the formal education process within schools, that's, that's one way. Um, I like the talk about the, um, made the youth um, programs within the faith-based uh, communities. That's another avenue. I'm honestly not sure what's the most effective way, but I know that the need is there and, and it's huge. I, this is one issue that I, I sometimes lose sleep on, knowing that the wealth of knowledge and, and information could, could all of a sudden go away as we're beginning to lose our elders who have been in this fight for a long time. So, so how do we keep it going and how do we um, keep moving forward? Um, this is an issue, this is some of the work that our organization is doing. So we bring in um, different activities like art, art activities, um, you know, movie nights. Um, we're trying to do things a little bit differently to, to make the issues of nuclearism, nuclear colonialism more palpable to a younger generation. And so some of my, the people in our organization they, they want to have more fun, you know, and, and to, to do this work and to do it in a, in a way that is interesting and exciting. Um, however, I get caught up in all the paperwork and the, the government reactions, but um, it is something that we need to do. And I'm willing to work with you all moving forward to, to kind of bridge the gap. If, if your young people want to learn about uranium mining and indigenous human rights issues, I, I, I will be, I will volunteer that you know make that connection and to to help with that education and to connect with some of our elders who are experts in nuclear waste management or you know nuclear waste policy and so these are some of the things i look forward to to working with you on um Kekashan and all of you um so let's you know plan something and get some types of workshops together i know this is what they're also going to do in um, africa so in different places i've been trying to make these connections and and I think it's a small step, but maybe, you know, down the line, some of these young people will start to take on the work is, is, is what I hope. Absolutely. Yes. And, and you are right. Voices is a wonderful uh, platform where every single voice is respected, no matter how old they are or where they come from. So uh, thank you for sharing your views with us, Leona. Marilyn, let us hear from you. I'm not sure where to start. Um, Leona, I, I'm so um, touched by all of the work that you're doing. And, you know, I'm from the Charter for Compassion. And, you know, I probably need to say something brilliant about compassion at this point. Um, that, you know, the founder of the Charter for Compassion, Karen Armstrong, uh, said that it's all we have left uh, as a people that we need to act on each other's behalf. And Monica told us about the importance of education. And I think it, it really is true that we need, to, we need to deal with this at every single level and at every opportunity that we have. And you know, when uh, Monica and Bill were telling their stories, you know, I thought, my God, I, I grew up in the atomic age. Uh, I was under the desk. Uh, we had these drills. 
because we were frightened of what was going to happen. I was a little kid and I remember one night, uh, I, my parents went to friends' home, uh, just not too far from, from my house and a huge siren went off. And that siren in communities uh, was a warning. It was a test warning, but I didn't know it was a test warning. I thought the nuclear bomb was coming. And, you know, as, as probably a six-year-old, uh, you know, I was, I was like, I'm going to die just like they did be, uh, in Hiroshima, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And um, I'm going to do it all by myself. And so I think that, you know, we have to tell the stories. We have to bring back John, John Hershey's book uh, that Monica referred to. We, we have to, uh, we have to watch films like Chernobyl. I, I mean, how could you watch that series without being touched? Um, I, I watched last night the film, I guess it's a new popular film about the life of Madame Curie. And what a powerful film that was. I, I'm, I can't imagine that every high school student's gonna sit down and watch that film, uh, but it is, it's just a wealth of information. Um, you know, I think that we have to change people's, uh, we have to bring back missing pages of history. They're, they're totally hidden from us. People don't understand the urgency of this moment. They don't understand uh, uranium mining. Um, they don't understand um, like that, that final chord that might be struck. So education, I think, is, is really extremely, extremely important. Um, and I think, you know, we need to work with educators. We need to work with students who are willing to put forth um, a commitment to, to bring back those, those pages of history and, and rewriting the new pages of history. Absolutely. And it is our hope here that, you know, we are able to do that and with great success so that we can achieve, uh, turn this dream into a reality. So thank you so much for sharing that uh, with us. Education is absolutely uh, critical, especially in uh, such trying times. And, you know, this has been such an enlightening discussion. Thank you so much, panelists. And it has truly brought together voices from across myriad disciplines. And I'm sure we have questions from uh, the Voices youth team and the audience. And here, once again, I'd like to say that if you are on Zoom, please either raise your hand or put your questions into the Q&A box. And if you're joining us from Facebook Live, please leave your questions in the comment section and we shall uh, try to get to all of uh, the questions to our uh, panelists. So uh, with that, I see that the first hand that is raised uh, from the Voices youth team is Isaac Thomas. So Isaac, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Kikushan. Am, am I audible? Yes. Yeah, so uh, hi everyone, greetings of peace. My name is Isaac and I'm joining from Kerala, India. Uh, I'm one of the Global Council Trustees for United Religions Initiative and a team member of the Young Voices for a World Free of Nuclear Weapons group. Uh, first of all, let me thank all the panelists for this inspiring and informative session. Uh, my question is open to all the panelists. So uh, we, all through the session, we have, you know, we have been mentioning that this is a combined global effort and we do need our representatives and folks in power to understand the present situation and initiate this change along with us. So uh, my question is, what are the ways we could force their, their attention and how do you think we should approach them? Thank you, Isaac, uh, for your question. Would any of our panelists like to take that? Yes, Monica, let's begin with you. It used to work really well to get people on the streets in big numbers. COVID has prevented some of that, but it still makes a stand. And letter writing or a social media campaign and then teaching us how to do it would be a really big step forward because 
we must engage the younger voices demanding this of their legislators so that they know that they will have people who vote for them and they are watching on this issue. And it is important for us to keep track of who in your body of government is important in, uh, on that and, and work with someone who's already in support of it. But also let's bring in the religious leaders and have them start talking about it in different ways. And let's cause a real bottom up, top down discussion because we are really looking to you to link in hands and move it forward with good information and a style that is only yours to share with us. Thank you, Monica. Would anyone else like to answer the question? I yes. think coalition building is really uh, essential. Um, and, and when I say coalition building, I, I think that, you know, if, if we had um, people like Leona, if we had Monica and Bishop Swing, but we had youth groups and what we started to do is to, to work together to educate each other and then to say, you know, to act compassionately uh, because compassion is action and you know what's the most necessary action that we can do and I think that that Monica is right you know uh, we can uh, make a loud noise if we do it together absolutely thank you Marilyn Bishop Swain you had your hand raised um how many letters does it take for a congressman to take something seriously? If you write to your congressman, how many letters, uh, they get rid of them, and then all of a sudden they say, wait a minute, that's at this number, we gotta take this seriously. The number is five. <laughs> if they get five letters, their staff is responsible for letting them know that constituencies uh, are, are um, aroused about this issue. Uh, therefore, uh, how can we get groups of six? <laughs> uh, it would be easy to mobilize six scientists, Native Americans, religious people, leaders, six, just send them to, uh, you know, that the second thing um, we're working on uh, making little uh, videos for young people, uh, 60 seconds, uh, two minutes, that's it. Uh, uh, we keep thinking, uh, and we want these for kids. Um, uh, we, we keep saying to kids in effect, uh, you're too young and naive. You'll have to grow up and understand what we understand uh, about nuclear weapons. And you're, you're really too dumb to, to matter on this. Um, but uh, the kids are, uh, they might not know about uh, throw weight or whatever, how many weapons, but they know about Cinderella and they know about Superman and they know about mythology and they know go the good and the bad uh, in the story. And if we can translate, we, we, what we gotta do is translate the nuclear uh, issue into the mythology that young people, little kids can understand. Uh, we're not gonna convert a whole lot of uh, 65, 70 year olds. Uh, they're, they're where they are. But we could we can bring a whole lot of young people along if they could see it in in their own mythical terms or create their own myths out of their own imagination. If we give them some uh, verbal, uh, uh, visual uh, images to uh, to allow them to to grow up into this. So um, I think there are, I think there are a lot of ways to do this. 
Thank you so much, Bishop Swing. Yes, Pragna. Yes, I completely agree with uh, Bishop Swing. And that's exactly what we see at Green Hope Foundation. The wealth of unique knowledge that children bring in is just truly amazing. Absolutely. And that is why we are having this uh, discussion uh, today with a multi-generational dialogue. So thank you for uh, your answers. Uh, Vincent, you had a question? Yes, thank you very much, Kikeshan. And uh, I'd like to express my thanks to all the panelists as well. So before I begin, allow me to better introduce myself. My name is Vincent. I'm actually a member part of the Voices um, Youth Member. At the same time, I'm also a Soka Kai member, just like uh, Peng Hui here today. So my question is more of a personal note to our panelists itself. Because uh, when we talk about certain issues, like for instance, environmental and financial issues, for instance, um, people may be much more interested to work on it rather than things like the nuclear abolition. So my question would be, what keeps you going, especially when nuclear weapon is something, um, I mean, the prohibition as well as illegalizing the nuclear weapon will actually take decades to come. So like, what keeps you going um, to do what you're doing in ensuring that nuclear weapon may not be in the face of the earth anymore? Thank you for that question. I think it's a very pertinent uh, question. Would any of our panelists like to answer that? I'd love to answer. Uh, okay, uh, yep. Bishop Swing, then uh, uh, The people I work with keep me going. Uh, it, it, I love to work with Marilyn. I love to work with Monica. I love to work with Isaac and everybody. Uh, if this is really, if it's just a lonely little task that you're doing by yourself, this is impossible for me. But if I get more and more people of great uh, uh, moral stature inside them, uh, uh, to work with. Uh, they keep me going. Thank you so much, Bishop Swing. Peng, you had unmuted yourself. Yeah. Um, where should I start? Um, I think back then, what really troubled me was nuclear weapons pose a sense of, um, it, it makes us feel powerless. At least it, it made me feel it made me feel very powerless to the fact that I, I can't do anything about it. Uh, that's what I thought back then. And earlier when, um, when we've mentioned that there aren't many youth involvement in this, I guess uh, as a youth myself, I could speak, uh, I hope I could speak on the behalf that it's not that we do not want to talk about it. It's more on the fact that it made us feel hopeless and hopelessness is, is horrible. But because we do not have proper communication with everyone else as to how we can approach um, nuclear disarmament altogether, how can we make efforts, disregard of however uh, insignificant they are, but we can still make an effort. And I guess from, from my from my perspective, from my um, experience at least, it was the opportunity for me to um to share in that peace forum back in 2018, until today um, annually. Um, where I could work with um, students and youths across um, the varying disciplines itself to continuously share the, um, um, the, the peace proposal itself to the community and share with them the fact that um, nuclear weapons itself pose a, uh, just, just a gross disregard to human rights. And I think... Uh, the the one the the one um, solution at least that that I found through my journey since twenty eighteen was um, okay perhaps I I I am not as powerless as I seem to be anymore I'm no long I'm no longer feeling hopeless because I truly believe that the one solution that I come across is dialogue cross generational cross faith cross uh, countries and um, people of power, people of within your community itself. And here I'd like to um, share a quote that I wholeheartedly believe in uh, by Daisaku Ikeda. And I quote, in the end, peace will not be realized by politicians signing treaties. True and lasting peace will only be realized by forging life to life bonds of trust and friendship among the world's people. Human solidarity is built by opening our hearts to each other 
This is the power of dialogue, I unquote. I truly believe that lasting peace can be achieved through dialogue between people. And that goes for nuclear disarmament as well, dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Pank. Monica. Um, I want to thank you for this question, Vincent, because I don't think we've put enough emphasis into talking about part of what we do is for the future generations. And it is so important for us to be able to think not just of ourselves living in this point at this time, but this world, this planet, this universe. And for me, it's been a joy to use nuclear weapons as one of the things that I can talk about with my grandchildren. And I use the prayer any time, a number of times a day because I sign every email with it and everything else, may peace prevail on earth. And to know that to do that is not a singular issue. It involves not just us, but our ancestors, those who've died for peace and protecting the planet and those that we are building a future for, the hope and the way to bring people across languages, across everything is not just compassion, but appreciation and gratitude. And so I just thank you, Vincent, for one, being a part of this Voices, and also for just bringing us together from around the world to say it matters. It matters today and it matters for the future. Absolutely, thank you uh, so much. Uh, would anyone else like uh, to answer? Uh, Leona, yes. Uh, yeah, thanks. As for myself, um, I am not um, representing any um, organized uh, uh, religion or a faith-based group per se, um, but I think as an indigenous person, I, I can only speak for myself and, and, and at times my people, but I do know indigenous people all over the world have, um, many of us have our cultures intact and our languages. Um, I'm learning both, I'm still learning my language and about my culture and that's what sustains me. Um, this is when people talk about self-care, um, of course, you know, we all have to sleep and eat and, you know, take care of our, our, our physical selves. But I think um, for me, if I didn't have um, the people in my community and, and the, the folks who helped to carry on our, our cultural ways, it would be impossible for me to do this work. So it, it is through prayer um, and, and, and the long lived traditions that have been carried on from my people um, since time immemorial. So I would encourage all of you that come from, you know, culture-based uh, societies and communities to, to also use that as your strength because it's, it's, it's something that's protected me and something that keeps me moving and also even helps to um, direct my work. And so this is something I, I'm very happy and fortunate to, to have. And so that's, that's how I continue on. And of course, the people I work with and most of the time we do this work, not for ourselves, but for future generations and for our mother earth. Thank you so much, Leona. Pragna, you raised your hand. Uh, yes, uh, for me, uh, it is the thought of what would happen if we stopped our work that keeps us going. Yes, it may take many years to abolish nuclear weapons, but if we give up now, we are going to condemn our world to a horrible death. We also need to understand that uh, we can accelerate this process if we begin by involving the youngest members of our society, which is what we do at Green Oak Foundation through our disarmament education, so that when they grow up, they will take the right decision. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that uh, with us. And I see that we have one question from our audience, uh, nothing from Facebook Live is yet, but uh, we have a question from Roger Eaton who asks, as an overarching strategy, I would like to suggest we aim for a global network of cities, not just for the SDGs on the one hand or for peace and nuclear disarmament on the other, but for all the goals of the UN. Any thoughts? Who'd like to take that? Yes, Marilyn. 
You know, Roger, part of the work of the Charter for Compassion is to help facilitate compassionate cities and uh, initiatives. And we have as part of our goals, uh, exactly what Monica was talking about, which is um, looking to the future generations. Uh, so I would love to, to talk with you and strategize a little bit more. We're committed that all of our compassionate cities, we have 400 registered, uh, would think about taking on the issue uh, that we've been talking about today. The other thing is, is that we're working with UNESCO's Cities of Learning. And I think that's another opportunity that we can strategize on. So I'd really welcome a conversation about this. Thank you, Marilyn. I saw Monica raise her hand. Oh, thumbs up. Okay, uh, <laughs> great. Uh, anyone else would like to answer that? No, and if not, um, I do not see any uh, further questions from our audience. Thank you, Roger, for uh, your uh, question. I, at this moment, I don't see any more uh, questions, but I'd like to thank the Voices Youth team and the questions uh, from uh, the audience. And thank you, panelists and audience, for being so actively engaged in this discussion and for your very inspiring messages. So uh, before we conclude, I would like to thank my fellow Voices Youth team members for their time and inputs. We met at varying times of the day and night, overcoming time zone challenges to bring this together. So with that, I shall now give the floor to the panelists for their concluding remarks in 30 seconds. So we shall begin with Monica, you have the floor. I have to just say thank you. I think having this conversation, particularly right after Thanksgiving in the United States, but leading into a holiday period amidst COVID, we know that the nuclear weapons issue has been here for 75 years. We absolutely must work to make sure it doesn't get to 100. And we had this brilliant person who a few months back said, we should aim to make it so. And all of a sudden, this is percolating up. So I put out the challenge today. Let us take into our hearts, making sure that nuclear weapons are abolished within the next 25 years and sooner if possible. And I just thank the voices of the younger generations from six on up or any age to put their heart, breath, prayers, actions into making this an issue that we actually accomplish. Thank you so much, Monica. Peng, you have the floor. Thanks, Kekeshan. Um, yeah. And uh, I'd agree with um, Monica when she, when she mentioned that we absolutely must um, abolish nuclear weapons from the face of the earth. 75 is, is already a, a considerable number of years that they exist on the face of the earth, and we should strive to not let it cross 100. And I think for my closing remarks, I, I'd like to highlight on and build upon um, the words that uh, Prakna mentioned, that um, peace and uh, disarmament education i like to add even further, humanistic education itself places a lot of prevalence on how we can interact with one another. And ultimately, I believe that if there's any challenge that I'd like to throw to everyone here today is um, start a dialogue. Find someone, someone new that you, you've met, um, initiate a conversation, get a, get, get a ball rolling on um, nuclear disarmament, get their perspective and share your thoughts and, and what we've known. And last but not least, thank you for all the fellow panelists, Kegashan, team, uh, the Voices team, for allowing me, giving me the opportunity to be, to stand amongst um, our uh, panel of distinguished guests to to share my two cents on 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 my thoughts on nuclear disarmament. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peng. Marilyn, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, I think I certainly would like to share everything that's already been said. Um, I believe truly that this is um, an interconnected issue. 
it's interconnected with the climate, the, the challenges that we have to save the earth. Um, it's interconnected with the communication um, barriers that we have with one another. Um, you know, it's almost as if many years ago, you know, people were asking the question, do you uh, feed people in Ethiopia or you, do you teach them how to be farmers uh, for the issue of sustainability? Uh, you certainly have to do both. And so, you know, I'm going to go back to that coalition building that the issues that we have in front of us are not singular, singular issues. They are interwoven, interconnected, um, and that we have to strategize to figure out how is it that we bring a, a new level of consciousness uh, to understand, um, you know, co you come to a level in consciousness that you realize the oppression that you live in. And, you know, it doesn't matter um, where we are in the global community, but we have to find ways to really challenge ourselves to come to a new consciousness uh, so that we, you know, as I said uh, in the very beginning, that we can really change that story. Thank you so much, Marilyn. Pragna, you have the floor. Yes, I would just like to um, conclude by saying that we need to start holding the nuclear club accountable for their actions and demand transparency on these issues. We need to dispel the myth that nuclear arms provide a sense of security. We need to teach students from a younger age about the consequences of nuclear arms and educate them about their role in this movement. We also need to provide more opportunities for the youth to express their opinions so that we can truly achieve an intergenerational solidarity and cross-generational dialogue and collaboration. We faced the dreadful consequences of nuclear weapons years ago when the first nuclear bombs were dropped on the Japanese cities. And we should not commit this mistake again. Yet, 4,000 active nuclear warheads capable of mass destruction. And I believe that we owe it to ourselves and the future generations to mitigate this problem of nuclear proliferation within our lifetimes, because further procrastination can only have cataclysmic consequences. Lastly, at Green Hope Foundation, we say we want books, not nukes. Thank you. Thank you, Pragna. Uh, Leona, you have the floor. Um, thank you. I, I just say, you know, the work that you all are doing um, to keep it up, um, communicating across the globe is, of course, with the time change is very challenging and the limitations of um, internet access and, and some of these things are a reality. But um, I think this is something we, we learned through COVID is that we can continue our work and it has made the world even smaller when we are all connected um, in this way. And I think um, my, my closing thoughts are to ask everyone to bring in the issues of all of the different parts of nuclearism into the discussion when, when talking about all the other issues you work on. And so for me, my focus is nuclear colonialism, which is very much based in racism um, the United States was founded upon policies of racism that go back to the Doctrine of Discovery, a 15th century document um, that, that was based within, um, at that time, I, you know, made the Catholic Church, I'm not sure what, what institutions existed, but I think within your power, you know, dispelling some of these old, old documents that are still used to oppress people around the world would be the first step, as well as talking about you know, some of the issues of, of nuclear colonialism with um, not just with weapons and energy development, but across all of the issues um, that it touches. Um, intersectionality is a term I think that can be quite limited, um, but it, it does, it, there are issues when it comes to 
you know, contamination of our food sources. So we can talk about reproductive justice. We can talk about all of the fights across the world. And I just ask you to bring in these topics when you're dealing with these things, especially in the climate fight, that nuclear energy is not a solution to climate change and that we should not push it. And then to educate on, on why, you know, so, you know, talking about nuclearism, nuclear colonialism, in, in all fights. And um, this is what I hope people can do and to take, you know, some messages that we learned today and then expand on it by by learning and watching other talks that are available online. I can I can share some links in the chat and I just want to end by saying thank you um, for the conversation and thank you for the invitation and I look forward to getting to know you all and working with you more. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Leona. Bishop Swing, you have the floor. Uh, yes, uh, I think that all of us who have a vision of a world free of nuclear weapons, um, our job is to be um, infectious, to be super spreaders. Uh, that's it. Thank you so much, Bishop Swing, and thank you so much to all of our panelists. Today's discussion has proved that a world free of nuclear weapons is definitely possible, but it requires actions from all of us. Change is never easy, yet history is witness to the fact that often it does have extremely humble beginnings. And this proverbial sword of Democles that hangs over the head of humanity needs to be dismantled. And today's conversation highlighted how critically important it is to accelerate this process. And it's now up to us to build on these dialogues and mobilize public opinion and actions amongst all sections of civil society, highlighting how wasteful and unjust this entire process of nuclear armament is so that reason prevails. So on behalf of the Voices Youth Team, I would like to thank all of you once again our work has just begun. And as I always remind everyone, the pandemic is not over. So if you care about your loved ones, please follow the rules, wear your masks whenever and wherever required, because we need to be strong and healthy so that together we can achieve a world free of nuclear weapons. Please stay safe and we shall see you soon at our next webinar. Thank you so much and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kekashan. Thank you, everyone. Bye.